Hello students, welcome to today's lecture. Today we are going to discuss the second part of chapter 10 of your business studies book. The name of the chapter is internal trade. In the first part of the chapter, we discussed about various categories of internal trade. We know that internal trade basically refers to trade within the boundaries of a country and it is broadly categorized into wholesale trade and retail trade. We saw at length that how important wholesale and retail trade are for any country's trade chain. They both provide several important services to both sides of the trade chain. Thereafter, we also talked about different types of retail trade. We saw that retail trade can broadly be categorized into itinerant retailers and fixed shop retailers. Itinerant retailers can further be of several types and that's what we saw in the first part. We saw that itinerant retailers could be either peddlers and hawkers or market traders, street traders, cheap jacks, etc. Having done that, today we are going to talk about another very important category of retail traders that is the fixed shop retailers. As the name is self-explanatory, fixed shop retailers are basically those retailers or shopkeepers or shops and stores that have a fixed place of business who do not keep changing their place of business very often. These fixed shop retailers are further classified into small shopkeepers and large retailers. We'll talk about different categories of small shop and large retailers one by one. Let's begin with fixed shop small retailers. As I've said in the previous part, India is a country of small businesses. We all see a great number of small shops, businesses, small stores and shopkeepers selling their goods all around us in our localities, in the markets, on the streets and roads, etc. Small retailers are all around us. If we were to categorize them, then we can put them into three or four different categories. The first category would come up as the general stores. Yes, the very famous general stores that we all go to on a daily basis in our own localities and nearby areas. Right, general stores are the most commonly found in the local markets and residential areas. As the name indicates, they do not deal in a specific type of goods. They rather provide a variety of goods, particularly of daily use. Such stores remain open for long hours that gives us convenient timings and they often provide credit facilities. So they are very useful, especially for our daily needs. Apart from general stores, we have specialty shops as well. These type of retail stores of late have become very popular. You know, as their name suggests, these specialty shops deal in a special or a particular category of goods. They do not deal in a variety of goods. They would focus on one particular category. For example, there could be a shop selling menswear. There could be a shop selling ladies' shoes or children's garments or toys only or just gifts or just school uniforms. We all are aware of such shops, right? We see them around us selling a particular category of goods. Such shops are called specialty shops. These specialty shops are generally located in a central place where a large number of customers can be attracted easily. On the other hand, the general stores are located within localities so that they can be easily reached by people on a daily basis while the specialty shops are located at a central place. Apart from these two, there are street stall holders also. These small vendors are commonly found at street crossings or other places where flow of traffic is heavy. So I would also advise you, my dear students, to remember these shops with their names. You can describe them just with the help of their names. Just as the name of street stall holders will suggest you, these stall holders put up their stalls at a street or at a crossing where there is a heavy flow of traffic. They attract floating customers, people who just come and go, they just pass by that area and they deal mainly in goods of cheap variety like hoisery products, toys, cigarettes, soft drinks, etc. They get their supplies from local suppliers as well as wholesalers and the total area covered by these tall holders is usually very limited. 
Therefore, they handle goods on a very small scale. That's why their shops are even called stalls and not, not even shops. They are a good source of purchase for people with modest means or modest incomes because they provide goods at second hand prices. These goods are sold at lower prices usually. Such shops may also stock rare objects of historical value and antique items which are sold at rather heavy prices. So, all these four kinds of small shops are very common, isn't it? We see general stores around us, we see specialty shops around us, we see these street stall holders and we even see such second hand goods shops. These are all very common in our daily lives. Having talked about these small shops, now let us also see how much are we aware of large stores. I am sure you must have heard about them, particularly in urban areas. These large stores can further be categorized as departmental stores or chain stores or multiple shops and there are several other categories that we will talk about. Primarily, the large stores are of two kinds, departmental stores and chain stores. Talking about departmental stores, as their name suggests, departmental stores usually have separate segments or sections or departments for different types of goods. They are usually dealing in a wide variety of products and they classify these products into different well-defined departments. They aim at satisfying practically every customer's need under one roof because they are selling huge variety of goods all categorized under different categories. They work on the principle of a pin to an elephant serving everything that a customer needs under one roof. This is the spirit behind a departmental store. Modern departmental stores even provide facilities such as a restaurant, a travel information bureau, telephone booth, restrooms. I mean, you go to these stores and you won't feel like you're in a shop. You would rather feel like you're in a hotel. You have so many facilities there. Apart from buying goods, you can even go and utilize these services. Therefore, we can say that they try to provide maximum service to higher classes of customers for whom price is of secondary importance. So basically, while small shops usually cater to people from middle to lower income groups, departmental stores serve customers from higher income groups. These stores are generally located at a central place in the heart of a city so that they can attract a large number of customers at one place because being large stores, they cannot actually go to every corner of the city. So they basically try and be at a central location so that people from Various locations can reach there and do their purchasing. The advantages of departmental stores are that, first of all, they attract a large number of customers. As a result, their sales are very high. So, people who are running departmental stores usually deal in high volume of sales. Secondly, they provide convenience in buying because customers get everything under the same roof, specifically categorized so that they don't have any problem in finding their goods and they can buy everything that they need at one place. Apart from this, these stores also provide attractive services as we have talked about. They have a whole lot of services including restaurants, travel bureaus, in telephone booths, restrooms, etc. So there are such add-on services also that they provide. Now fourth benefit of these stores is that being of such large scale, they get economies of large scale operations which means that they can buy goods in bulk. They can buy their material, their goods that they are selling in bulk quantities and when they do so, when they buy in bulk quantities, they get discounts from their suppliers, which reduces the cost for such stores. And that's what we call as economies of large scale operations. Apart from this, they also are a good way of promoting sales because these stores attract a large number of customers. They help in promoting sales of different products that they are dealing in. If we talk about some limitations of such stores, then the first limitation would come up as lack of personal attention. You know, when you go to a small shop which are located in our localities, we are usually quite familiar with the people in the shop. There is a personal connect, there is a personal attention that a customer gets when he or she goes to a small shop. But this is what is lacking in departmental stores. You don't know people as such there. So there is no personal attention or personal contact as such. You are just one among thousands of customers coming on a daily basis there. On the business side, since these stores are operated on such a large scale, 
their operating costs are also very high. Costs such as electricity bills or salaries, etc., rent and all, these are really high. And that is what creates the third limitation. There is a huge possibility of losses as well because they have to ensure that they are covering their operating costs every day, every month, which sometimes becomes difficult. Finally, their location sometimes proves to be a limitation because they are not located nearby. It is not convenient to go to such stores to buy goods that are needed at a short notice. You know, when you need something at a very short notice, you would prefer just coming downstairs to your house and finding the goods nearby. But these stores do not offer that facility. That is why their location sometimes becomes inconvenient to the buyers. Apart from departmental stores, there is another very popular category of large scale shops. This is chain stores or multiple shops. You would have seen that there are several companies or several brands that have their stores at multiple locations under the same brand name. You know, there is this chain of such shops that these companies operate from. You can find them very easily in the field of fast food chains. Be it burger chains or pizza chains, there are so many such examples around us not just in the food segment but even in segments such as shoes, clothing etc where there is a common brand name that is operating several shops or stores at several locations. Such stores are known as chain stores. Under this type of arrangement, a number of shops with similar appearance are established in several localities spread over different parts of the country. These different shops normally deal in standardized and branded consumer products which have rapid sales turnover. These shops are usually located in fairly populous localities. The manufacturing or procurement of merchandise for all the retail units is centralized at the head office, which means that, let's say if there is a company or a brand that is operating 50 stores, the procurement or manufacturing of their merchandise will be done from the head office only and then it would be sent to all these different stores. Each such retail shop is under the direct supervision of a branch manager who is held responsible for its day-to-day -day management. All the branches are controlled by the head office which is concerned with formulating the broad policies of the entire chain of stores and even getting the policies implemented. The prices of goods in such shops are fixed and all sales are made on cash basis. I hope you are able to relate these shops with some brands that you would have seen around you, whether in terms of food or in, in the field of you know shoes and clothes, etc., you would have seen such brands that are at multiple locations. That's what we mean by chain stores or multiple shops. These shops or stores offer several advantages to both consumers and producers. For producers, there is economies of scale because such stores are operating at a large scale with number of you know multiple shops they can buy their goods procure the raw material at a lesser cost secondly since companies manufacturing the products directly open their chain stores they eliminate middlemen elimination of middlemen also proves to be useful for the consumers because this provides them with an opportunity to buy the goods at a reasonable price also, since such shops deal on cash basis only, therefore, there are no bad debts for them. That is a good big amount of relief when there is no bad debt for a business. Besides, they also operate at low cost because they, get, they are getting the economies of scale. And since one particular company or brand has so many shops and stores, the risk of loss gets diffused. It means that if, let's say, one particular shop is occurring losses, those losses can be covered up with the profits of other branches located at other localities because usually not all branches will be at loss. Due to some locational or some other factors, a branch at one particular location may be at loss while another branch at another location may be at profit. So the risk of loss gets diffused or spread over all these branches, which reduces the overall risk of the company. 
Apart from these advantages, there are certain limitations also of operating such multiple shops. Number one, for consumers, there is a limited selection of goods because when you go to such a shop, you get goods of one particular brand. That limits your choice or your options. Secondly, since such stores are on a large scale, they lack personal touch. When a consumer goes there, he or she does not feel that personal touch that we could probably feel at a small shop. Also, it is difficult for such shops to change demand. You know, once they have started operating at a particular place, once they have started getting a particular, you know, quantity and quality of demand, it will be difficult for them to even introduce something new and change the demand pattern of the consumers. Also, there is a lack of initiative among the employees of such setups. Because all the decisions are usually taken by the central office, the head office, the branch heads or even the employees at several branches might just not take any initiative to do good things on their own. These personnel who are managing the multiple shops, they have to just obey the instructions received from the head office. As a result, there is no initiative or incentive for them to come forward and do something on their own. This sometimes even leads to lack of attention given to the consumers when they enter the shops. So we have seen these two biggest categories of large stores under the fixed shop criteria of retail trade. Apart from these two departmental stores and chain stores, there are several other types of businesses that operate on the fixed shop model. They might not be that common to us, but they still exist in the country. One of them is mail order houses. Mail order houses are the retail outlets that sell their merchandise through mail. There is generally no direct personal contact between the buyer and the sellers. For obtaining orders, potential customers are approached through advertisements in newspapers, magazines, circulars, catalogs, samples and bills, etc. Price list is sent to the consumers by post. When consumers see such advertisements in these several you know, categories, be it newspapers or magazines, etc., they see the advertisements and if they like the product, they can place an order by mail, that is by sending a letter or by sending an email in today's times. Then the company sends them the price list or the quotation and then the customer places the order if he or she likes the prices. There can be different alternatives for receiving payments in such a case. Because you know, in, for mail order houses, payment becomes one important criteria, one important category or area because they are not facing the customers directly, they cannot collect payments at the same time, so they have to work at a really safe and secure mode of payment and there are several options for this. First of all, the customers may be asked to make full payment in advance. Secondly, the goods may be sent by VPP or value payable post. You know, under this arrangement, goods are sent through post and they are delivered to the customers. But they are delivered only when the customer makes the full payments on the time of at the time of delivery. If the customer fails to make the payment on delivery, the goods are taken back. This is what is known as VPP or value payable post. Now, this type of business is usually not suitable for all types of products. For example, goods that are perishable in nature or are bulky and cannot be easily handled are not recommended for mail house trading. Another important point in this regard is that mail house businesses cannot be successfully carried out unless education is widespread because these businesses basically depend upon these mediums of advertisement that require people to be literate to read the advertisements or to understand the advertisements. So areas where education level is low, these businesses find it difficult to attract good amount of sales. Having understood what mail order houses are, let us talk about their advantages and disadvantages. The first advantage is that there is limited capital requirement because these businesses do not need to set up shops because they just need to have a warehouse or a storage system where they can just keep their goods and everything is done through mail. So they do not require huge capital to set up their shops. Secondly, they eliminate middlemen because the companies directly approach the customers. So the middlemen are eliminated. As a result, customers get the goods at a better price. In these shops also, there is an absence of bad debt because they 
operate on advance payment or payment at the time of delivery. Since they are not dependent upon a physical location, they have a wide reach. They can reach to any area through phone or mail or whatever means of communication they are using. They don't need to depend on physical shops. And that is what creates convenience for producers as well and for consumers as well. The consumers do not have to go to a particular physical shop. They can just order from the convenience of their house through mail call or emails. But there are certain limitations also. Like there is a lack of personal contact and huge lack of personal contact basically because nobody can see each other. The producers and consumers are just not seeing or meeting each other. They are just dealing through mails. There is high promotional cost because uh, these businesses basically depend on promotions or advertisements. Unless and until they advertise or incur promotion costs, their customers will never know about them. So they incur huge promotional costs. Usually there is no after sale service. This is also a big drawback. They do not provide credit facilities. This is another limitation from the customer's point of view. And since they depend on postal delivery, delivery sometimes gets delayed. That again becomes a big drawback for such organization. Now, apart from such mail order houses, there is another category which has been emerging in the recent years, which is the consumer cooperative stores. A consumer cooperative store is basically an organization owned managed and controlled by consumers themselves. Such organizations operate with the objective of reducing the number of middlemen. You know, some consumers just come together, form an association and start a cooperative store where there are no middlemen. They can just buy directly from the manufacturers or wholesalers and sell among themselves. It is basically serving the members of the cooperative. These stores generally buy in large quantity. As a result, the goods are cheaper and that is another big advantage for the members of such cooperatives. Also, since the middlemen are eliminated or reduced, the members get products of good quality at cheaper rates. The profits earned by these stores are utilized for declaring bonus to the members or for strengthening the general reserves or general welfare funds or similar funds for the social and educational benefits of the members. If we talk about the advantages of such stores, then first of all, they are very easy to form. Secondly, the liability of the members is limited. Third, there is a democratic management because these are basically working on cooperative model where everybody has joined voluntarily they take decisions together, there is voting and there is a democratic system of managing the stores. Consumers get the goods at a lower price. Usually there are cash sales, so there is no bad debt. They set up their stores at convenient locations. So there are all these advantages that these consumer stores have to offer to their members. But there is a certain set of limitations also. For example, number one, there is a shortage of funds. Since these are consumers who are coming together and setting up stores, they do not usually have huge you know, funds to set up such stores. They always suffer with this problem of shortage of funds. Secondly, there is a lack of patronage also. Because the members of these stores generally do not patronize them regularly. They generally do not really buy goods that often that they do with some other dep departmental stores or some other shops. As a result of this, these stores are not able to operate successfully or generate high amount of sales. Also, since these are consumers running their stores, they lack business training. They lack management skills to manage such stores more efficiently. This is also a very recent phenomenon that is taking place where consumers at a particular area just come together and take this initiative of setting up a store. These are not that common as yet in the country. So, dear students, today we have seen four types of large scale fixed shops and four types of small fixed shops. All of these were usually very common and we can easily relate to them because we've seen such types of stores around us. All of these have certain advantages and certain limitations that makes them suitable for some people and not so suitable for some other people. But they all hold a very important place in our society, in our economy. When we come in the next class, we'll see another very interesting category of such fixed shops of large scale that are supermarkets. 
you all must have heard about supermarkets or must have visited supermarkets in urban areas right so we'll talk about supermarkets and then we'll talk about something very very important which is the goods and services tax so till then you revise all that we've learned till now in this chapter and come in the next class to learn something really great about the gst i hope you were able to understand the concepts of today's class this was it from today thank you